come. So welcome, thank you again all for being here. I am Jenna Green, the Operations and Programs Manager for the Glass Part Society. And before we get the program started, we have a few logistics to cover and some online community practices to review. We are recording today's program and posting it to our YouTube channel. So while we hope you'll keep your cameras on, only do so if you're comfortable. We also ask that you mute yourself unless you are speaking. And if you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear them. Um, and because we know people engage in different ways, you're welcome to grab the mic and unmute yourself to speak. You can use a raise hand function so our guests or our moderator can see if you have something to say, or you can just use the chat box so, and we'll do our best to address all your questions. Also, closing extra tabs on your device can help avoid video delays or glitches, so now would be a good time to go ahead and close those if you don't need them. And as for our online community practices go, we ask that everyone be respectful, speak their own from their own experience, and then challenge yourself not to make assumptions, instead ask questions and go deeper. We also want to acknowledge that some of us are on, currently on Indigenous lands all across the world, and people are dealing with issues of colonialism. For those who haven't been to a GAS student meetup program before, these are monthly virtual meetings meant to create space for students from around the world to discuss glass materials and processes, view lectures and demos, attend virtual studio tours, meet leaders in the glass community and more. This program is run by myself and Paige L. Morris, MFA graduate from Virginia Commonwealth University and our current GAS student representative. So with that, I'll hand it on over to Paige. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jenna. So for those who don't know me, my name's Paige. I use she, her pronouns. And um, thank you for coming today. And for our international uh, Petra Kucha participants, uh, Charlotte, Ariel, Patrick, and Ross Smith. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves during their Petra Kucha so we can kind of just get the ball rolling. But I do ask that um, you hold any questions, like speaking questions till the end, but if you want to throw a question in the chat box during, that's great. We'll, I'll make sure that it gets asked and answered during the Q&A. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Charlotte, who will kick us off. Hi, guys. Um, so I am here in sunny Scotland, in Glasgow, to be precise. Um, and I'm currently an MFE 2 student at um, ECE, which is Edinburgh College of Art. Um, so I'm on an interruption as we speak because of COVID. So I'm sure you guys are kind of <laughs> caught up as well in, in all of this. Um, and as we don't have any access, or we haven't had access since December, I decided to take an interruption. I, I'm hoping to go back in September uh, because I can't work over the summer. I've got two little people <laughs> and the, you know the, the eldest one is off school and I really want to spend some time uh, with them. So I'm hoping to go back in September. Now, let me see if I can share this screen. Oh, oh where is it gone? Um, let me just, I hope this is the right one. Uh, I am, a, oh yes, it is. Um, I am a technical dinosaur, so please bear with me. Um, let's see if you do, 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 do. slideshow. There we go, hooray, we've taken the first hurdle. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. So thank you for coming. Um, I uh, have, I've kind of come into art from a, a left wing kind of thing. So my first degree is in music, I'm a classical singer. Um, and I'm also a trained yoga teacher. Um, and so for many years I've worked in that field. And then in uh, 2009, uh, my husband suggested to me to why don't you go back to college and do something just for fun so don't do anything that might enhance your career or whatever just just do for fun um because in scotland we have a thing called council tax or in the uk we have a thing called council tax really expensive uh, you pay where you live even if it's not your own house or your own flat you rent you still pay an amount of money towards upkeep or things and it's um, worked out by how much the property you're in is valued 
So uh, if you live somewhere nice, even though it's not yours, you get taxed a lot. If you're a student, you don't pay it. So my husband said, why don't you go back to college? And I thought, oh, great. So I ended up doing a HNC in Applied Arts, a, a one year course, and that led to a jewelry, two year jewelry course, silversmithing, um, and then into glass because I did some glass when I was doing the Applied Arts. And then, yeah, I ended up doing this master's, which I really love. Um, oh, okay. So, oh, something's happening with my screens. I'm so sorry. Okay, here. So this is a piece I did uh, while I was doing the silversmithing. And even then I was really interested in a glass-like material. So this is Perspex that has been heat bonded and then carved and polished by hand. Uh, and this is another piece that where I heat embossed some Perspex. And actually when you wear it, uh, if sun or any light shines onto it, there will be a pattern that's being projected in shadow onto your skin. So again, it was a glass-like thing. And then I moved on to the glass and, and glass is really my, um, my favorite medium, to be honest, to work in alongside ceramics. Uh, so I played a, a lot with dropouts and, you know, a bit more, not conventional in a, in a sense of what I was, the techniques I was trying out, but, you know, I, I wasn't in a, in a place that's gone wild, which I am now. Uh, so these were like early pieces with, with lace imprint in Bill's eye casting. Um, and from there on, I, I went back and I did the second year of the applied arts course that hadn't existed when I first went back. So at this point, I have two little people uh, and Frida, our youngest, uh, is about two and she doesn't sleep. And I am constantly sleep deprived. And uh, this piece is called Broken Sleep. So um, I took photos every morning just after waking up for two months. Uh, and I had this, this photo bank um, and there was no filters. And just the moment I woke up, I would take a selfie. Um, and then this translated into a series of work in screen printing and in collaging. Hence, I look really terrible. But that was another thing is just to document in auto ethnographic way how I was feeling and how I, how I was looking. And then that translated into a, a screen printed, three, three layer screen printed glass fused piece. Um, and on the left hand side there, there's me doing a, an imprint for a, cast for um, ceramics so again it's 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 showing it's coming to a point where i'm really using both materials quite quite regularly um and again that was in my applied arts um degree these are spoons that represent memories and how um, you lose your memories and how the glass gets refracted so i i cast the glass directly into those spoons and the, the spoons deteriorate and the glass deteriorates and on the other side I, I really love throwing on the wheel so I have these two loves I have the glass and I have um, the ceramics and now we're going into uh, me going into ECE um, so in the first term at ECE we had this brief where we had to um, imitate another material in glass so this is actually a cast glass vessel 40 centimeter size so pretty big um inspired by the late potter lucy Ree. um and i really wanted to give it a, a glazing as well so i was working a lot with the idea of how can i glaze my glass because obviously if you're glass students or interested in glass you know how it works um you have your glass if you put something else on top and you put it back in the kiln it might you know it will melt again so uh this was a two two-way process where i made uh, a mold and I cast this and then I reapplied sort of glaze in, in brackets and then put my mold, made a refractory mold completely around it so that my shape wouldn't be destroyed in the recasting of it. Um, so there's a, a couple I did there. So uh, this is ECE in our plaster room uh, late at night, really, really, really exhausted. But yeah, these are my shapes um, and they were produced by making actually a, a clay mold, a clay piece a clay master uh, in a sledging rig with a sledging rig and then from that making the um, the wax the waxes and then casting them so the piece on the left uh, is um cast with oxides inside so the idea was again to mimic a different material um, and then that takes us to a, a pat de verre piece that i really like it's really quite small it's only 10 centimeters high um and although it looks like ceramic, is actually pat de verre and the glaze is a ceramic glaze. So things are flipped around. So you might think it is 
uh, a ceramic piece with some glaze on top, whereas actually it's it's the other way around. And then that got me really thinking, and I, I, I like the pâte de verre in a kind of bastardized way. And I, I love people making these beautiful pâte de verre things, but that's kind of not for me. And I really like really tough, um, sort of tough textures and, and rough textures. And so the white bits that's made of pâte de verre, and I left it in my mold, and then the mold went back into the um, annealer kiln. And then when it's hot enough, I was blowing glass into them to create these kind of stone-like um, pieces and that got me thinking really about uh, what I could do with this um, and then that got me to something else so these are the, the next three pieces are made again by Pat de Verre so the outside's Pat de Verre and then it's hot glass cast so you know the thought was well I can blow into it but can I actually you know go back to the furnace and um, fill it with furnace glass and and that was really interesting process and these have actually got um, texture inside so I was playing around with two part molds so that I could have an inside texture for the pâte de verre so you don't have just a smooth nice inside but an outside and inside texture. Um, so this is this has come about again it's this in the same series but the keyhole or the, the lock um, whatever you want to call it that's from come from a residency I did in France um, and I, I took casts from everyday objects I could I found in the chateau so this was just a lock that I took a, a a mold from and I thought oh that'd be quite nice using it in in this piece uh, and this one is the biggest out of the three so it's 25 by about 18 centimeters solid when we we ladled in loads and loads of lava which was great fun to do um, and this is this is the point where we then go into first lockdown uh, so this is March 2020. I'm halfway through, more than halfway through my first year, and I'm kind of running with it, and I feel really good about my MFA, and then boom, <laughs> we have corona lockdown, and everything grinds to a halt. Um, so yeah, that wasn't great. Um, and then in September, uh, we were al allowed back in, which was great, but with a lot of restrictions, time restrictions, but also restrictions in the hot shop. So um, no assistance at all. You have to blow everything by yourself. Nobody can help you. You're there, out there by yourself. <laughs> and I'm a newbie, you know, I've, I've only started glass blowing when I started my MFE. So this was a real big thing. Um, but I wanted to keep um, kind of experimenting with the pâte de verre. So, so I started using some pâte de verre pieces and then this ring was placed in the pickup kiln and brought up to temperature and then I was blowing into it. And my teacher said, you won't be able to do it. And I thought, yes, I can. <laughs> I'm an Aries, I can do this. Um, and this is the resigning piece, which I really quite, quite like. Um, and then, oh yeah, here we are. This is our crew. Uh, this is the hot shop in ECA that I terribly miss, I have to admit. Um, and then these are my my friends. So Amy at the back with the striped t-shirt and then Laura at the front is our technician. And then Wendy and I, we, you know, the three of us, we are on this MFE course. Um, so I'm really hoping that we can go back pretty soon because um, I really miss it. And it, it's really lovely, nothing against you boys, but. Uh, it is a whole female, it's just a female workshop. So our head technician is female and everybody's blowing is girls. So it's a really lovely uh, environment, very feminist environment actually uh, to be in. Um, and these were some experiments I did with color feeding and, and sheep, and vortexes, and it's all to do with um, what I'm working on at the moment is to do with um, chaos and order and finding a balance in you know in this very uncertain times that we find ourselves in um, and this was a project we had to do <laughs> in the first term actually in the first term and we were just told to to write down five words that we associate with hot shop work and then pick one and mine was uh, staying centered because you know you all know when you blow if you're off center everything will fall off your blowing iron and you have to be really with yourself and as a yoga teacher as well, I feel I have to be in my center. So I decided to make um, spinning tops that actually did do spin, which is quite nice. And they were just uh, test test handles. And I could combine my jewelry kind of side with that. Uh, and that really takes me to uh, stuff I did in September, uh, which is really now going to combine the ceramics with the balloon and some experimental glass. So that was a series that that I did before we got again shut down 
Um, so slip casting, so I made the same mold is used for slip casting for foam glass, for glass blowing, um, and you know, all other kind of pat the wear work. So it's quite nice staying with the same shape and be utilizing one mold is, is a quite a nice way to do it. So this is the, the white shape is a bow in China. And um, the other one is blown glass with foam glass uh, that I combined. And this is just in a hot shop. So having a lot of fun in the hot shop. Uh, and then yes, the foam glass that I'm kind of experimenting with a lot at the moment. Um, so we're kind of wrapping it up. So this is me going home on the train. Well, just before we could not go on trains anymore. Glasgow and Edinburgh, if you don't know, is about an hour apart. So it takes me an hour and a half door to door. Um, and I would walk down to Haymarket Station and I had this, was this amazing evening and there is no filter on this photo with the car. And I just really love the color fade. And there was, a, a, again, a vase I made solo kind of trying to work out how to blow without any assistance, without punties, somebody bringing in punties. Um, and I just really like that feel about uh, that. And then this is, again, coming back to the glass with the ceramic combination. So um, this is a textured ceramic base. That I that I made with, which has pate bear inside, and then that lets it be combined with the with the glass blowing in a hot state. So the the pate bear glass acts almost like a glue between those two. So there's a lot of working out. How will I do this? How do I not crack my glass and all this? So uh, this is something that um, will feature in my degree show whenever it might come. And then at the moment, as I said, I'm, I'm locked out of ECE. I'm in this honest interruption. So I've moved into a ceramic studio in Glasgow, which is great. It's got lots of kilns and there's a glass studio next door. They let me use their kilns. So this is my new space and my new project. Um, and I'm working with icosahedron. So these lovely shapes are icosahedrons, 20 sided, equal 20 sided pieces. And these are the molecular structure of glass that we all love and don't usually see. So my, my degree show, my degree show work will be based around um, kind of that. And then here I am uh, again, back in the hot shop. I've just singed my fringe. You can just maybe see that. Stick your head in the needle, maybe not such a good idea, but it reminds me of good times. So this is why I stuck the photo in. So you can find me on Instagram under Charlotte Rogers. Just make sure there's no E at the end because um, you won't find me otherwise. Uh, I'm on Facebook and I have a website called the beekeepersdaughter.uk. So thank you very much. And yeah, here it is. Paige, can you remind us who our next guest is? Yes, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, the next person will be Ariel. Yes, thank you very much. One moment. Okay, so can you see the screen? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here and yeah, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, yeah, so this will be my Pacha Kucha. Um, I'm now almost 27 years old. Uh, I live in Israel um, and I just finished last summer uh, my BFA in Bezalel Academy of, of um, Art and Design in Jerusalem uh, here in Israel. and. And uh, now, uh, next September, I will start my MFA in a Rhode Island School of Design in Providence in the US. Yeah, so uh, I've already said everything about that. Um, yeah, so I did my BSA after my military service which is mandatory here in Israel. Um, the, BFA, the BFA was seven, it was four years um, with emphasis on glass. And in that I did mostly uh, glass blowing, but also some ceramics because it was the ceramics and glass department. 
Um, Ariel, sorry to interrupt you real quick. Um, we're just seeing a black screen, so you might have shared what? a different. So yeah, didn't want to get too far ahead in your. Sorry, <laughs> I've asked if you are seeing everything. <laughs> I thought I was like, oh, maybe it's just like a black screen to to kick us off and then something. I have asked. <laughs> One moment. Sorry. No problem. Okay. We'll try this again. That's why I need to do it before. Wait. Okay, and now is it sing? I'm still seeing a black screen. Hmm. Really? No screen. Oh. Yeah, I have no idea why. Because for me it says. Yeah, I'll move on. Are your slides through uh, like a PowerPoint or do you have like Google Slides? Because we can or, try uh, through Keynote. Oh, okay, because I was going to say you can try sending it to either Paige or myself and we could try sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I'm sharing my screen again. So bizarre. Okay, so move on and then we'll do it <laughs> another time. Well, Paige, what do you think? Do we want to maybe circle around back to Ariel? Because I feel like you should have your visuals with you. Yeah, if, if that's okay, let's go with Patrick. And um, I just Googled something from the Zoom Help Center. So mm -hmm. I'll direct message that to Ariel. Okay, yeah. awesome. Because yeah, want to make sure you get your time to shine. So we'll circle back. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Ariel, could you unshare for a moment? Yes. That way Patrick can start. Here, sorry. All right, open system preferences. Why am I earth? Do I have to do this? Here we go, privacy zone. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> I'm having a similar problem. Yeah, I can't seem to load it up. Oh, how strange. Yeah. It's like Friday the 13th, but, <laughs> but <laughs> were you using similar slides? Um, I'm in, I've got a, oh, maybe that's why here. Let's try this. Hang on. Sorry, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Love yeah, the sorry about that. With technology. We use, we use teams here at school. And um, so I haven't actually done this on Chrome, on uh, Zoom yet. Let's try this. No, nope. no. Security. Just give me one more second. Here we go. Security. Event security. Yeah, it won't let me. Okay. Are you? Do you? Are you using a Mac? I am. Okay. Um. Oh, here, 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 here. Here we go. Okay, I might have to come, I might have to come right back in. Hang on just one sec. Should I go ahead and go in between? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Thanks, Russell. All right, let's see if I can figure this out. All right.
All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Rasmus Nospring. Um, and I live in Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm currently doing an MFA at Konstfak, University of Arts and Design. Do you hear the seagulls? Never mind them. Um, they're just trying to mess with us. Um, so, yeah, I'm currently doing a, a master's at Konstfak, um, along with uh, running a studio called oh, can't move uh, called Stockholm Glass, which hopefully you can see here. Um, and I have a background as a traditional factory worker, where, where I started my training when I was oh, well, let's go with that one when I was uh, fifteen, and I worked there for about um, I think it became nine years, eleven years. Um, before I started uh, my, what's it called, bachelor at Konstfak University as well. Um, so this piece is from the bachelor work uh, and is part of a series that was focused on daily routines and how, you know, like that morning cup of coffee or whatever thing that you have for yourself in the morning, um, just to stay in control of your daily life. Uh, and this is called uh, 404, after the time that my coworker that is portrayed here um, took a shower in the basement of the factory. He was always the first one in and the first one out. And as he got out of the shower, he was always, he got on his underwear and then he was standing there air drying um, while he was massaging his calluses on his hands. Um, and this went on every day. So he was air drying before he could wrap the rest of his clothes on. And it was just a, a beautiful, a beautiful routine he had um, to get on with his day and get out. He was always so proud of these calluses because typical macho glassblower, he'd been working there since he was 13, he was in his almost retiring uh, age. Um, and it was, sad to see how you know this work that he loved and was really pr proud of was also killing his body um and this one's called 542 from uh, another co-worker that had his morning routine to have breakfast on the toilet so that he can sleep 10 more minutes um but let's move on to when i started my mfa two years ago i took two years off in between the bachelor uh and the masters to um partially start uh, Stockholm Glass with my friend Simon. Uh, but here's from when I went back to Raymond Glass Works, which is obviously a big part of who I am um, since I started there in such a shapeable age. So I went back there for my master's project to um, go through their archives um, of old molds and see if I could find anything that I used there that I could use there. And, and basically my memory started with this idea of how much of what one remembers is actually true. Like what, what, what if your memory that you have that creates your own, like one's identity, how, how much of that is actually fabricated or modified events that you've just remade. So I wanted to go back and visit the factory and see if I could get this into my master project. And there was, this is just a tiny, tiny, there's probably like 40 times. Well, you just see half the row, whatever. Um, and as I was going through them, I found a bunch of different old figurines, like pressed glass figurines that most of them were made in the fifties. The factory started in eight, the um, 1810. So, but a lot of the older stuff is thrown out. Uh, but I found a lot of this kind of figurines uh, that was press glass molds um, that was used while while a lot of my coworkers started. So they learned on this molds and some of them came back in production while I was there every now and again. And I was allowed to borrow them for the master's project. Um, so I started pressing these and doing these different assemblages, um, trying to find like a representation of these people that 
all these people that's also representation of me or like a big part of my identity um and it kind of started developing into combining this with uh current influences such as also Jung Nielius and Joachim Oyanen, uh, who's both working glass, but Oyanen is mainly a ceramic sculptor. Um, so combining it with these kind of studio glass looking, or at least Swedish studio glass looking um, forms and color, um, like the Fritz stuff, uh, we'll get more into that. And also these more graphic, Bases is basically just these optic mold pressed um, black powder glass that I've pulled out and then folded back to get more of yeah more of a graphic looking and also trying to uh, connect back to the history of cold working glass which was a big part of what made uh, the Swedish glass. Uh, big abroad um, with Orifars and Costa Buda, which most of the people that might visit the gas conference, if it happens in Sweden, uh, will go and see. <clears throat> Here's another one um, as a process shot in my studio. And this is the final show that I'll be presenting on Thursday, my final exam uh, situation, which is really weird. It, 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 a lot of things have stayed open with restrictions uh, and during the pandemic. Um, so we'll all be on Zoom and there's been videos of it that we haven't seen yet that will be running along with our presentations. And I thought that I will read you the exhibition text. <sighs> always reads this one. In this work, I have looked closer at how memories are constantly reconstructed and connected this to my practice in glass. Coming from my background in glass factory training, I've used my craft to examine how memories change and along with it, the definition of one's identity. I was allowed to borrow and use old graphite molds from Damien Glassworks for this project. Most of them were made and used in production during the 1950s. I reproduced the figurines from the factory's production and dissected and assembled them into new representations of both personal and generic memories. Memories are volatile and constantly in change. And each time a memory is replayed in your mind, it's a little bit different from the last time it was visited. They're highly unreliable, yet a foundation of who we are. Each sculpture starts with a memory that I connect to the pressed glass objects that I use, which is then put in a conversation with something contemporary that inspires me and that I wish that this memory knew. A portal to, to the subconscious invites you to follow how memories are formed and rearranged, reenacting new potential events. If this is constantly happening, as we recall our past, saving the most recent version over its last, how do we know who we are? And yeah, so basically, like I said, I've, I've been pressing these memories or these representations of memories, both of memories that I have from the factory and that I could relate to other events in my life, but also a lot of the stories that was told to me while working there and trying to introduce these, th like these people or these events both happy and sad to to new new influences, um, uh, and I'll just go through the last couple of images. Do, 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 do. I just got stage fright. <laughs> All right, but um, that's it. And thank you all. So much cool people in the audience, so. Oof. <laughs> Thanks, Rasmus, that was wonderful. Um, next, Patrick is gonna <laughs> try to share his screen again. And if not, I have the presentation. So hopefully we'll get it up one way or another. Yeah. 
All right, one last try with this, and then otherwise we'll get Paige to flip for me. Um, no, Paige, you're going to have to bring it up. For some reason, it's not even showing now. So, okay. if you don't moment. mind, so I'll just I'll just say next slide or make of some course. really silly sound and. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I got really confused for a second because it was your presentation. I don't know. <laughs> All right, cool. And you can see that, right? Yes. Great. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, hi, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my presentation is a little bit of a um, out in left field presentation. Um, I am not a glass practitioner, um, but I come at this from a, an architecture point of view. I've been practicing architecture for the last 20 some odd years and decided to take a sabbatical from that practice and do an MFA in craft media um, here at the Alberta University of Arts in Alberta, um, in Canada. So you can find me on Instagram there. Um, so by saying I'm not a craft practitioner doesn't mean I haven't had experience in glass, um, but I don't, I don't use the material primarily. Um, my work is focused on, on materiality in, in, in a sense of, of the material telling a story. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I've spent probably one of my, one of my dear friends who's also a cohort um, right now in the MFA program with me um, is a glass artist. And I probably spent 60 to 70 hours watching demos in his, um, in his hot shop um, and participating and just sort of being around in that, um, in that environment for quite a while. Um, so I probably have a little bit more um, time spent in a hop shop than some undergrads do in, in a single semester but I've only ever played with molten glass once um, for about five minutes. Um, but I have done last semester um, some fusing and some casting and just sort of trying to get involved in the material that way. And there's this really lovely um, and quite striking um, ethereality that comes with the material and in the way that it sort of holds light and captures light and, and as it needs to, it can get itself out of the way. Um, and as, as an architect, I'm coming at that from that sort of perspective. And, and I've used glass frequently, obviously, in the work that I've done that way, um, but not, not necessarily as, a, as an art form. Um, I, on my committee um, for my MFA, I've got um, Carlin Sutherland, uh, who is a glass artist from um, Leibster. Um, in Scotland, and she is yeah she is one of my secondary one of my secondary um, committee members, and so she's also has a a, a, a background a, as an architect. Um, so there's a nice sort of dialogue there that we can um, play off of one another. So uh, Paige, if you want to switch slides now, um, yeah. So like I was saying, I'm kind of in a way. Uh, how do I say this? I'm kind of in a way, um, my craft practice is almost a sort of perversion of the craft practice. Um, I don't work in primarily craft materials. Um, the, craft, the craft materials here that they, they sort of comment and suggest are, are ceramics and glass and fiber and wood and, and metal and jewelry. Um, but my practice is primarily based in latex. Um, and so there's this kind of, um, ephemerality that comes with that latex material as well and this sort of fluidity and sort of plasticity and elasticity that comes along with it as well um, that isn't present in glass except there are these sort of overlaps in terms of their transparency and their um, and the way you I'm using the material to begin with I work with li liquid latex at first and then it dries and it becomes this sort of um, elastic piece um, so this particular piece was one of the first ones I made entering my um, my MFA um, and it was a reaction to um, a moment in my life when um, 
I felt disrupted and perverted almost as, as a queer man, um, where these group of people threw this particular brick through my window um, with duct tape wrapped around it that said faggots written all over it. Um, and so I kept that brick as sort of like Rasmus was saying as this memory uh, keeper. Um, and I chose to make a liquid, um, a, a latex um, shield out of it, um, kind of in a response to what had happened to me. Um, I mean, it doesn't, it, you know, being a queer man in, in, in Alberta, it's a very sort of conservative area of, of the country that I live in. Um, so it's not unusual for that sort of thing to happen. Um, if you want to switch to the next one. So that piece continued on in multiple forms. Um, and I started casting that particular cast um, in soap um, as a way to sort of cleanse the ideas and cleanse the issues that had sort of arisen from that piece. Um, and then, okay, Paige, if you want to switch to the next one. Um, and then this is installation of m duplicates and multiples of that cast. Um, and so you can kind of almost see this sort of essence of glass that's coming out in this, in this piece as well, the way it captures its light um, and re-radiates its light out. Um, this is actually going to be part of a performance. I'm not quite finished casting enough bricks yet. Um, at the moment, it's 100 pounds, and I'd like to make it as heavy as I am. Uh, so I need to add another, another 80 pounds to it. Um, so I'll end up, uh, or whichever comes first. If it ends up being as tall as me first, by the time I hit that that target, we'll see. Um, but I'm I'm going to keep playing with it. Um, but this is going to become part of a performance piece as well, while I'll, where I'll um, hand these out to a lot of my other queer friends, and we'll um, video ourselves showering and. Clean, cleansing with them and then I'll restack them. Um, and then every time it sort of gets um, gets shown again, then we'll, we'll do the same performance until eventually it will be nothing and it will be sort of dissolved. Um, okay, next one. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to go through a series of, of the, the work that I've been doing really and sort of focusing on the material and the way it sort of tells its stories. And so here are some cast buckets that I made. Um, again, kind of dealing with, um, with these notions of, um, of cleaning and maintenance. Um, and I think what is now sort of developed, I'm only partway through my MFA. Um, and so my questions are still sort of developing themselves and they haven't really solidified yet, but the questions I'm kind of working with um, now are relating a lot to a lot to home and to the notions of home and what happens when home is full of a, a bunch of naughty children. Um, the the objects I make are very disobedient. They don't work. They no longer function with the intent that they were primarily um, formed by. Um, and so they act on me and they react on me and they have this sort of um, effect of, of just claiming a, claiming a space. They have this, this agency. And as I've been sort of assembling them into my, um, into my mid program review um, research show, um, they've been yelling and screaming at me and causing quite a ruckus. Um, and so as we move through, you'll start to see and feel a little bit more about that too. So we can go to the next one. So they, in response to these objects having agency, they end up, I, I am sort of fetishizing these objects. As I create these pieces, um, these objects are, I'm like being hyper aware of that, that piece that I'm playing with and that I'm sort of making a cast of. Um, and once that object is complete, once I'm finished fetishizing it, they actually turn around and start to fetishize me. Um, and they respond to me in a specific way that wasn't intended in the first place. And they start to sort of look at me, um, especially when I start to perform these pieces, um, that they, they start to criticize who I am. They start to objectify who I am. Um, and then in turn, the viewer, um, next, I forgot I put this naked one in there. Oops. <laughs> Should have given a warning. There's penis in this one. Um, uh, so this next one again is, is again fetishizing this particular coat hanger that I have that actually houses my, um, a leather coat that I've gotten that that particular leather coat is, um, is a, a way of me to wear armor and as a 
sort of piece of protection for me when I go out into cert, uh, certain experiences. Um, and so again, it's, it ends up being quite limp and useless. And so I've actually um, destroyed the coat hanger that it came from. Um, in the making of this one, and I sort of ripped it apart and, and pulled off its, its, its hanger. Um, uh, you can go to the next one. Um, this one I'm titling three-way because there's this sort of frustration. I don't know if anybody else has light switches in their house that are on a three-way switch that never line up with each other. You always have one that's up and one that's down, and it's so drastically frustrating that you can never sort of control um, your environment that way. And you can spend hours trying to figure out how to actually get that to work. Um, but again, so now, now I'm talking about home and the way that home is now becoming sort of this disturbed, just frustrated um, position. Um, and what I've been thinking about lately is because we're having now these conversations in Zoom um, and the penetration that has happened into my private security of my home um, and what home is, and now we've, we've sort of opened up our world to, um, to everyone, and we haven't asked our home if that was okay. Um, and so I think that's kind of a reaction as to why these objects are doing what they're doing to me. Um, so next one. So this is, again, one of the first ones I had made. Um, this is my little buddy. Um, he is a candle holder that used to live in the back of my china cabinet. Um, I never used him. Um, and then I pulled him out and made a, uh, made a cast of him. And now he's got this um, really kind of delightful quirkiness. And he follows me around and I take photos, photos with him in all sorts of spaces in my house. He's got his own Instagram account. Um, and he just sort of goes along for the ride. So he's a little bit of a security blanket for me. Um, next one. So there's a few of the pictures of him living in different cabinets and things. Next. And then this is, he was really sad that day. So he was contemplating his death. Next. Um, and then I've also started to work with a little bit of leather and a little bit of um, um, of my front garden. Um, and so I, I take the, the objects and uh, the plants that I've got out of my front garden, I dry them um, and assembled a dustbin that, um, well, a dust brush and a dustbin that leaves more dirt behind than it did when it started. Um, but late, uh, uh, anyway, we can get into a little bit more about what lavender does sort of medicinally too, but um, we won't really need to do that. But um, yeah, this is sort of a reaction and, and sort of creating something that is a very difficult to use and leaves more of a mess behind than it did to start with. Um, next. You want to run that video? It's very short. So I don't really know why I put this one in. Um, I have six pieces that I've actually inflated um, with my breath. So I've, I've, I don't have enough time to show the video for the other one, but um, I cast a big giant rug in the middle of my studio and inflated that to sort of spill, fill some of the space that I was um, occupying. Um, and another couple pieces that sort of use my, use my breath as a way to give birth to them. Um, very similar to glass artists working in the hot chop and doing, um, doing a lot of blown work that way. Um, so next, I think we're almost getting close to the end. Um, I have a performance that goes with this piece as well. This is a, a cast of a, the dinner set for one um, and kind of had like notions of sort of being covered up, but um, you can roll this and pop it in your pocket. But the performance that goes along with this is, is me actually sitting in front of this, um, in front of this dinner set and tying myself to a chair with a piece of red um, latex um, and not using and not, uh, not sort of using utensils or anything, but um, again, being fetishized by that, um, by that particular piece. Next. 
I just think this one's really pretty. <laughs> That's about all. Um, it really does kind of remind me a lot of Charlotte's work in the Pat de Vere, um, sort of look and the aesthetic of it. And they're quite thin and lean and um, just sort of uh, elusive in that kind of way. Next. I mean, who doesn't have a conversation with Ikea all the time whenever you're frustrated, right? <laughs> Next. Um, I think we'll just leave it at this one. I don't know how many other ones I have, but I think I'll leave it here. Um, this one is, I had to clean out my bathroom sink um, when I had moved in the first time. And there was a woman who used to own my house who had very long blonde hair. Um, and so this is just sort of a, a combination of those two experiences and those two, two memories of me brushing my teeth and cleaning out this fucking disgusting drain. <laughs> so anyway. Um, and then, of course, you know, when you're, when you have an old toothbrush and the bristles get stuck in your teeth. Yeah. So anyway, I think we'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, there's a few more slides, but I think we can just leave it there. Thanks so much. Um, uh, this was really wonderful. Unfortunately, we lost um, Ariel to some technical issues. Um, but we do have about like eight minutes or so for questions. So I'll open it up to uh, the audience. I have a question for anyone who wants to answer it. Um, Cause a lot of people are coming from like disciplines that they're already established in whether it's like factory work or architecture yoga practice like do you find yourself having to unlearn what you already know as like an active part of your practice or do you or feel like you're building um, if i if i can go i i i have both so it is really interesting so we had a discussion about this actually in in one of our mfa seminars and it's almost um skilling to de-skill so you come to a point where you kind of you, you build up all your skills and you you know you know what you're doing and then it's almost like you have to let that go and let the material do what it wants to do to take you to the next to the next level what i found um for me is really interesting that i have these crossovers say with my mindfulness yoga practice and then glass blowing and throwing especially on the wheel and I come you know there's like this point of flow that um Mikai uh, Cheek sent me high in, in the 60s kind of termed this coin as a psychologist he current this coin of coin and um, term ah oh, can't speak this term and he coined it as flow and it's like this this place you go into when you're absolutely in your practice and it's almost like then you forget how to do things but your body remembers and you're in this in this zone kind of thing so yeah I'm, I'm with you you kind of have to let go of your your learned stuff to I think to go to somewhere else but you have to get to a certain skill level I think to be able to do that as well but that's, that's maybe just my opinion I don't know yeah no I agree I think I had to I had to let go of that too I mean I think there was so much control being an architect um, that I had to just listen to the material, let the material do what it wanted to do. Um, and I, have, I haven't been working with liquid latex for very long. I used to work with latex and, and leather quite frequently, um, but not in that sort of form. Um, and in, in the latex that I was using before, um, it was always in this sort of tension um, versus this sort of um, floppy, um, flaccid kind of positioning but I, yeah there is a there is a point where you like like Charlotte said you just have to sort of release and let, let it go and let the material do what it wants um, but yeah I think we're I mean in my work because I'm thinking about home and I'm thinking about how that sort of those objects mediate our body um, there's there's a reference to architecture in the way that I, I was working before anyway so I think no matter what we're always going to pull that in um, because it's something you know already and it's hard to get rid of but I never touched on that in my presentation, but this is some, that's something that I've thought about a lot, um, like the de-learning or a lot of the, a big part of the process that I do now 
is wouldn't be acceptable from where I come from. So it's been, you know, a, a lot of unlearning all these. I mean, it's still really, you know, class nerdy hotshot stuff, but but not in the efficient factory work sense. Uh, and that's been a juggle that I still, it's still really hard to get out of. But it's always fun when I make it. <laughs> I think that's a good transition for a question I had, because it, in the like with the three presentations we saw, I felt as if there's uh, as if play um, has a big role in your practices, um, and I was just wondering how uh, you may want to, or any of you really would want to touch on that. Um, and especially like, I thought of it mostly with Patrick's presentation, but the idea of materiality being confessional. Um, but yeah, in all of your work, I see, I see play as like a, a very um, integral uh, way for um, exploring different ideas. Well, yeah, I think I think play is really important to be able to just experiment and allow yourself to have fun doing it, um, and sort of relieving relieving the control that we think we have, um, and giving agency over to that material. Um, and yeah, for sure, I think play is really um, is really important aspect of of being a maker. Um, I don't think, I think if we don't play, then we're, we're not sort of moving forward um, in any sort of significant way, or at least I don't know. I, don't, I like to play. <laughs> I've, I've got a piece right over here behind me that I was making a chair out of um, spray foam, um, like in, in spray foam insulation. Um, it is fucking hideous. So, <laughs> but it was worth experimenting. And I think I'm going to keep playing around with it, but um, I think there is, yeah, for sure, and, and a little bit of humor and a little bit of silliness and fun, especially in terms of, you know, where we've all been in the last year, I think there's, there's room for that um, and room for us to sort of, you know, sort of confess those little goofy, silly things. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I'm really experimental with, like, how I like to combine um, objects and, and materials, and there is this playfulness, and there's also this kind of you have to allow yourself, I feel I have to allow myself to just go, let's just try, let's go crazy. And, and it is like being a child. And uh, as I said, I've moved into this into this uh, ceramic studio and it's the most amazing thing. They have uh, a glaze room and I, I walked in and it is like being a kid in a sweet shop. And they just said, you can just use anything you want. You don't have to pay for it. You can just go wild. And I'm just like, my mind's kind of exploding because I'm like, oh my God, I can slip cast at the same time of doing this and this and this. And I think this is how you make kind of, um, you find things and you make discoveries and, you know, it's just, yeah, you have to play. I think if you get too rigid and you don't play anymore, then you get stuck. Yeah. I also feel like a lot of times it's when when you actually play that you or for me that, that I get surprised by the outcome or and that's when when it's the most stringent the the things that come out. And I think also not having, you know, too much of a preconception, you know, to allow the material to go where it wants to go as well. That that has this this quality, you know, and I've, I've made pieces where I that wasn't intended at all or something went terribly wrong. And actually, they're the best ones I've made. And they've set me on this path to something else and to discover something else that wouldn't have happened at all if it's come about the way I had it in my head. So yeah, I think it's allowing yourself and the material to have a play and to enjoy it. And, and that's like how I often quite like to describe my practice. Um, if people ask me what you do and I say, yeah, I, I go in and I play. I have fun with whatever I, I choose to do or to, to make or experiment with. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Rasmus. If it's something you, you know, the it doesn't, if you let it go, if you allow it to, to do, then you you will discover yourself and you will discover the material. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that also goes back to the play or the the tradition or yeah, new the Cooper's question. Um, I was experimenting um, later last semester as well as this one with other materials like the soap, um, for example. But um, later on, in like a few slides later, which we didn't get to, um, I have I, I cast some piece uh, some. Uh, slices of sourdough bread that I made and I sort of cast them in glass, but then I also was with the intent of sort of trying to see how that material was working or, or the casting was working. I actually cast them in butter, um, which became way, way, way stronger than, than the glass pieces. Um, and as well as doing that exercise, I was casting some um, like tea bags in glass and tea bags or um, uh, what are they called? Say uh, clothes pins. Um, but then I decided, okay, why don't we play and just see what happens with different material. Um, so I tried uh, bacon fat for the clothes pins and I tried some white chocolate for some other ones. And those materials came out far better than the pieces of glass. I mean, it was just my first sort of experience with the glass. Um, but uh, I found they came out a lot stronger because there was more of a story behind the material and the use and sort of the, the semiotics of that, that particular object. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have done it had I not had the mold already made um, and just played and see what happened. Um, now I want to eat that toast whenever I have an opportunity, but <laughs> I'm not allowed <laughs> to stay in the freezer. <laughs> so we have a question from Summer, and then I think after that we'll have to start to wrap it up. Um, I just had a question for Rasmus. Um, so your pieces feel like memorial objects or almost like here's an award or trophy. Have you gotten that before? Are you okay with that aspect of your work? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, in the thesis, I call them relique reliquaries of memories. So it's like they become containers that I charge with my in interpretation or, or my idea of it, different events or how they could have played out. So, so it's definitely, yeah, that's kind of what they are. Do you think that helps like your conceptual idea, um, like these reliquaries? Um, possibly, I mean, that's a pretty late, um, that's something that I, I thought of just a couple of weeks ago when most of the work was already done. So. But yeah, for, for understanding how I, what it actually is about, uh, it helps. But I mean, I'm, I probably won't know until a year or two what it's actually about. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you all again so much. This has been really, really wonderful to hear about all of your work. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Jenna. Yeah, thank you all again for joining us today, whether you presented or were just here in the audience and apologies for all the tech difficulties. Um, we're glad that we were able to hear from all of you. And this program is gonna be uploaded to our gas platform soon, including the website and our YouTube channel. Um, also stay tuned for next month's student meetup. It's gonna be May 11th at another slightly different time, similar to today, because um, we're gonna have our second international artist conversation. Um, so thank you all again for joining and we hope to see you next time. Bye everyone.